And some of the pressure points, and you've been to enough of seminars to understand that the theory of pressure point finding is one, hurts them, two, cause pain in the middle, three, cause a knockout, four, can kill. Then you'll read there's some pressure points you don't just spear hand or you don't just hit. And some of the meridians are more vulnerable. For instance, at 10 a.m., which was an hour ago, but countdown, the heart, your heart points are ultra-sensitive right now. <clears throat> your leg points are just winding down. If you didn't know that, you divide everybody at the waist. Everybody at the waist, and this is 12 noon. And the legs up are the easiest to attack in the morning. If for any reason I was out in this parking lot and going to get attacked, it'd be in the morning, I am probably going to kick you in the legs. You're more vulnerable. Up to noon. From noon to midnight, it slowly changes. <coughs> From noon to midnight, it slowly changes. And you're more vulnerable up here. So just picture the sun coming up, and you know. So that's all you have to know about the fighting. Another thing that you do take into account is full moon. It's easier to knock people out on full moon than little moon. However, I don't look at the moon before I do a seminar. I do not let that influence me. That's just the degree. Well, you've been to seminars where I've knocked somebody out and they've been almost dead on me. Well, you can bet that's usually a full moon. That's usually what happens. Full moon, deeper knockout, lesser moon. Not lesser knockout, but sometimes they just even go like this. But the fight's over. That's called one second fighting. That's the way I look at it. That's what, if I attack you once and you go like this, the fight's over. I can just do what I want to you. And we'll explain that a little deeper as we go along when we show you how you can kill somebody. But when I read other books, I'm going to get to that. This move on killing. This move on killing. The book that I said. How many are familiar with the meridians? How many know where the heart meridian is? Raise your hand. <laughs> heart meridian comes up the inside of the arm. How many know how they, the, the, the meridians are numbered? Heart point number one is right where my fingers are. Heart point number one are right where my fingers are. And heart point number one... And especially at this hour of the day, especially at 10 a.m., they say, where's the guy who's my volunteer? Oh, you. Thanks. Come here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, this is a Tai Chi book I'm reading that just explained this. The flow, the flow, and the hands open or closed. He says, the guy is punching. You're punching at me. He is coming underneath to catch, and he's raising the arm up to get at hard point number one. And I have my fist this way. You're to do this to get into it. Or you're to do this to spear into it. I'll just thumb in there, and he'll feel it. Doesn't this look like the move in the kata? And he shows a Tai Chi breakdown coming. He shows him coming underneath as a punch is happening and coming like this. And then he shows a pull, pulling the arm for the stretch of the nerve and striking. Now, everything that says in that book is that you are not to stretch and punch hard point one. I mean, it's just a chance he could die. You don't know if he will, but there's a chance he could die. I have never punched anybody in hard point one. I'm going to do it now, see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> but you are to raise the arm. You understand the difference, Dexter? Now, you got a meaning for that move, because you, you got that meaning from me also. Yes, that move can also be to here. You people know that from other seminars. But you probably never thought of what I just showed you now. And then I even got a better one than that. Because the Tai Chi guy that does this, do you all know what the floating rib is? Yes, the floating rib. I got a, you can go out right now to a sporting goods <coughs> store and buy a book on soccer. I just read a book on the rules of soccer. And it's in every sporting goods store because the World Cup for soccer is coming to the United States in 1994. And they're going to make a big thing of it. So there's a rule book out, and it says 1994 World Cup special on it. So you can read the rules and know what the rules are for the game. So I read that book. Now you probably wonder, why did he read that book? But I didn't read that book for martial arts. But in that book, a man in soccer, last year, no, last World Cup, 1990, World Cup, 
A man got hit from front to back with an elbow at the floating rib and the man died. He bled internally at the kidney. Now that's in that book. I only read that book about uh, two, three weeks ago. I got caught in that snowstorm in Atlanta, Georgia. I had nothing to do, so that was a book I read. I had nothing to do, so I only had a soccer book I hadn't read, so I started reading a soccer book. And I read the rules and everything. But I read that 1990 World Cup, and then I thought of the Tai Chi book, where the guy said to hit the floating rib with the next striking move. And the guy died at the World Cup. Now, I've done the floating rib for a long time, and, and, and I don't want you to do this, at least not today. If you play with another time, I don't care. I've done it enough that I have to touch. But I'm gonna go around and make you feel it like I do everything else, and I just want you to feel the floating rib. But I can put a hand right here. I have a spleen point right here that'll release the floating rib. I can release. You feel that loose? Now, if I do this, where did you feel the pain in the back? All the way through. I can take your floating rib, and I don't want you to do that playing around in this glass. I can, t and I'll do it to you if you want to feel it. When I go around, just ask me to feel it because I can do it just light. I will take your floating rib and make it touch your kidney. Just touch it. But if I did this, we can make it pierce the kidney. And I can do that every time. 1990, they did it in the World Cup by accident. He caught him with an elbow, and he was running this way, and he made the floating rib pierce the kidney, and the man bled to death. I read that in the soccer move book. About three months earlier, I read the Tai Chi breakdown was this. Punching, attack, heart point one. Front to back. Front to back. And I think a lot of you were here when I did a kidney knockout on the back. He explains that this hand is to strike the same kidney point that I strike as this one strikes the floating rib. So that I am pushing the kidney back to front for the knockout technique, but I am to take the floating rib and do what you just saw and strike it so that it comes back in. And the man will bleed to death. But I put those two together from two different books. I was reading one book, he said to strike, and I knew that before, by the way, because that's my breakdown for this move out in the Hanji 2. If you see my Hanji tape, when I break down the Hanji 2, I have a move that comes here, and that's what you're after. You're after this. You're going to trap and pin his arm and set up that spleen with this move, this hand. And you're going to take the floating rim and push it back in. So easy to do. When you feel it and I go around, and I'll let you feel just this, but I just place it there nice. I don't do it hard because I wouldn't want to injure anybody. You don't know how much it'll take. He feels it all the way going back. That's how you can just, you could kill somebody. You could be in close, he could be strangling you. If you try to strangle me, I can get you on both sides and just do that. And if I do it hard, how many katas go like this? Huh? Or have hand moves that come. Two hand moves down. That's where it could be two. Somebody's in close, they're on you. You can put a you can just tap this direction to loosen it. The spleen point right in the middle of the of the floating rib releases the floating rib if it's hit that direction. But then when it's hit that direction, it could kill. So this sets him up. He set up. That would finish the fight. So when you see moves like this, that's, that's where they're attacking. And they might not be attacking for that to be the drop point. They're attacking to loosen that and then shove it through. And I don't have any doubt in my mind that that man's going to bleed to death. I'm going to have you working on the, the, the grabbing. He's punching. Grab and lift. And I want you right here. I don't want you punching here, though. I just want you to get this move. Then we're going to work from there into another technique. So everyone pair off, grab, strike, electrical test. They got to know that to pass electrical test. If, if they are grabbing a live wire, if they lift this foot up, the current will just go through here and it won't kill them.
But if they grab a live wire with this hand and put this, ground that foot, especially the heel. They can even be on the ball of the foot, especially the heel. Now, as crazy as that sounds, that relates to what we do. Your bladder meridian is water coming <laughs> under your heel, up off the heel, and up the back. You understand that? I'm going to show you something. <clears throat> but you cannot do it in any one of the other classes you go to. And you better not do it when I'm with you. Because it could, you could get injured. Because let's say you did it on, on Wally J or Remy Presas. He is going to go to the, the next routine to injure you. You got that? He's going to do this to injure you. Some of you people shouldn't even be hearing this in this room. But let's say I do a technique on you. And you've all been here when we grab the wrist and torque the points. If I kneel down. If I kneel down. And you just let me know if this hurts, okay? Okay. <laughs> Resist me. Does that hurt more? Yeah, that's fair to say. Yes. Now, okay? Pay attention. Because I'm going to have you do this in each other. But I don't want this to go out of this room. Because I don't want to injure somebody at one of my future seminars because you told them something they shouldn't know. When I go to do this routine, you lift that foot off the ground. Still stretching. But it's, it's just wrestling in strength. Resist. All because he has the bladder where you lift it up. You got that? Chinese people, for some reason, know this because it's in Tai Chi. And, and the reason I'm telling you is if you're teaching a seminar, I only had it happen, had it happen three times now in 10 years. And the Chinese do it sneaky. And, and, and I had a guy in Atlanta, Georgia, a Chinese guy come over to Atlanta, Georgia, and he lifts his foot off the ground. The foot doesn't even have to be noticeable. So I was going around the room and I was doing this technique, and he says, here, try that on me. Well, the minute, the minute I get somebody who says, oh, here, try that on me, like this, <laughs> like this down, I figured he had something different. You understand? And he just lifted his foot up just, just as much. Just as much. Just that much. That I couldn't see it. But I kind of knew what he was doing. Didn't even know his foot was off the ground, because he's really sneaky. He just didn't have the bladder meridian touch it. You just get the bladder meridian up a little bit, and you're here. Technique don't work. But all I have to do is short him, and it hurts him more. <laughs> in other words, that's why, that's why the kick will be in captain. That's why I'm saying don't do it in another seminar, because if you did that to a Wally or a Remy or something, and they go like this, and they can't do their technique, they're probably going to kick and hit you with something else, and, and now you're liable to get injured. All three Chinese guys that did that too, my wife Kim will tell you, went down screaming in pain. And they try to lead their students to believe, you cannot do these techniques and hurt me because of my mind control. No, it's body anatomy. If you've been to my other seminars, I get out medical books and I can show you how and why my stuff works. And it's electrical. You see, explaining it Chinese-wise is get the bladder meridian off the heel. And I only tell you that in case you're working with somebody and the technique looks like it won't work. So I'm going to have you do. But once again, I don't want you going out of here. And I don't want you going to your next class today or next week. If you're an instructor, if this guy's your instructor, or Jim Clapp's your instructor, and they're showing you a technique, I don't want you standing around doing this stuff to be funny because then they're going to go for it. The only thing you have to do is, to, is to, I don't have to kick that leg. If I kick it, that's what sends the pain. That's what makes the pain meet in the middle. So when the Chinese guy did it to me, I kicked him. I kicked him harder than I kicked him. I only placed a foot. You've all been kicked on the inner thigh point, right? You don't want this. <laughs> Resist me. You don't want this. And the inner thigh kick. See, feel it start to go? In other words, this and a full kick in there makes them meet faster. But all you need to do is go for the grappling. And all you need to do if he resists, stand up. Resist me. Resist. Now lift your foot up. All you need to do is touch it. I just had to touch. In other words, you don't have to kick this other leg. All it does is 
this ungrounds you, the person. I'm ungrounded. Now I'm grounded. And I want you to understand that the system not only works, it's for real. And, and, and a lot of Chinese schools will teach that so they'll, they'll give you that it don't work. And if you're out showing anybody or somebody's there and he thinks that it don't, well, it's not going to work on him, just, just even just do this. And it's gonna, does that hurt? Does this hurt? Yeah. Does, and lift your foot up. It doesn't hurt as much now, does it? You can resist it. Look. And it would hurt him more. And if I truly do it and place a kick on a pressure point, the pain will double him down. Which is what I did to people that were smart on me at seven hours. I mean, then one guy went down screaming in pain. And his students were there. But he thought he, he that's why he offered it. He stepped right out of the crowd. He wasn't even in the seminar as such. He was in the Oh, there, try that on me. And I seen him over there with the students. I guess he thought, well, it ain't going to work. So, so I got him out. I said, oh, yeah, yeah, come here. And, and I knew when the minute it wasn't working, he was playing one of these games. Either the spinning wheel or to lift the foot. But now that's why there's a cat stance in kata. Does that make sense? Yeah. You understand? This is not only defense, so you can't kick my groin. This means your technique better be real good. Better be real good. And it takes it away from being a simple technique into you better know what you're doing. So that's why there's a cat stance when you do a move. What I'm going to have you do is get up. I want you to pair off. Try any technique, but I don't want you to overpower and break the person's joint. Because you can do it on weight. If I get uh, this guy who's big, and I get him doing this technique on, on, on a little lady or a smaller man, and he's this big, or if I get Dexter doing it on somebody, and this guy lifts his foot, and Dexter kicks, Dexter's got all that weight going to break that wrist. <coughs> so I, I want you to just feel, lift your foot. The pain's not the same, is it? Now the pain's the same. In fact, it actually gets worse. If I were really to kick you hard, the pain would, would hit you in the middle like that. And I'm really to kick a pressure point when I do the move and I'm to place a kick. So that's why you have the hamchi that'll do this. That's why you have katas that'll do this. The minute the guy goes to a cat stance, that's your counter. And how many people, how many people in this room know what a cat stance was really for till now? Right? You understand? You never heard that explanation. There's a lot that I do that you probably have not heard. You understand? Because I am, I am looking into this constantly. I experiment. I'm experimenting now. When I go around the country, I get hands on with people. And I, I, I've worked out some things in the past eight weeks that I knew what I was doing, how I was doing, but I worked out, now I know why it works. So once you get up, try it, put him, make him stay on both feet, put him down, he'll say, I feel pain. Then I want you to put him down, but I want him to, he can just get off the ground. He can lift it like this, any way he wants. And by the way, there are some cousins where the foot climbs and moves. And they could be avoiding the power while they get in position to do something back at you. I want you to play with that, but I don't want anyone injured. Try it. And then touch him in the other leg. Nahanchi kata, right? Stand up. Why don't you get me something strong? <laughs> Come on now. I'm gonna, no. Yeah. <laughs> You feel that, right? Yes. What I want you to do now is this. Brush. Brush your feet. <clears throat> Same thing. So, when you cross to do this, when you cross to do this, you'll have many things that you can be doing. And when you do this, this really, I shouldn't even probably tell him most of you because I don't want you to get injured. We got some low ranks in this room. So you go do this on, on a high belt, you don't injure you. But you should know the deep value of kata that I get out of it. And when you cross in the hunchy, if somebody's going to kick you, if you do this, you won't feel it on the legs. If you do this, you won't feel it on the arms. Understand that? So you go to kick the legs. That's why these moves are in kata, not blocking. 
The protection. The protection. You're going to kick my leg. You can kick a point that, that you know will hurt you and drop you. But you do this and you kick that point, and you'll stand there looking at the guy. And when he's after your arms or upper body, even with a strike, if you do this, what you have to watch when you do that, though, is you could be off balance. That's why a lot of cutters will turn with it, or move with it, or spin with it, or even have a spin with it. To spin you out of the technique and kind of avoid what he's doing to you for a split second. And then when you're doing your kata, you'll understand. What I want you to do now, I don't care if you want to do the finger. I don't care if you want to do this. I want you to pair off. And when the guy does the routine, it can even be this. Resist me. Strength. Now lift that foot across your feet. Now, he's in. And I could probably, because I'm pretty strong, I can probably overpower with body weight. In other words, but that puts it back to a weight and size thing. <coughs> You got that? That puts it back to a weight and size thing. It gives you just a split second of protection. Is all that's for. A split second to give you the counter. So that's why a handle cross, that's why a handle cross on this. You can be attacking or you can be defending against him kicking at your legs. That's why the hand will be here and you'll be in a cat stance. You'll get the foot off the ground and you really get a double protection in case he kicks you. Now I want you to get up, I want you to <coughs> grapple, any way you know to put pain in the guy across from you. And then I want you to let it feel the pain the first time. But then I want you to go like this. Heel could be on the ground, it's even stronger and better if the heel is off the ground. And if you pay attention in, in the hunchy, you will cross like that. That heel won't be on the ground flat. So I just want you to do this. And then, imagine the counter that you can lay on the guy with your step out. Because just this step out can be an attack to his leg. Just that step out can be a sweep. Try it. All day long. Your experiment comes when you get back and you're doing a kata. My knowledge comes when I'm doing a cut all by myself. Not, this is the feeling part, the hands-on. When you work with each other, there's a catch-22 with doing the pressure points. <coughs> there's a catch-22. I mean, I can come in. You've all experienced the shot under the jaw, yes? <coughs> You've all experienced that. And you know that it's, whoa, it's a head rush, and it can drop you. Well, if you come in to do that, at class night. And he might agree with me doing it to him. So, okay, he said. The thing is, you only can practice it once. You all understand that, right? I can't keep hitting you all night long with something that's going to send electricity into your brain. That's where the catch-22 comes in. After we've already been talking to nerves, your nervous system is already getting a warning. So some people will say after the third or fourth time, well, I can't, uh, when I lift my foot, it's still not, it's hurting. Well, yeah, but you've been doing it how many times? That's the part of it. Plus, you've got to now put your mind to where the technique is. You've got to get water, energy flowing. You've been here for the spinning wheel, yes? Mm -hmm. Spinning wheel, you know the spinning wheel? Wally teaches that. Get a spinning wheel going? Yes? No? no, no, no. If, if, if you get in your mind, stand up here. If I catch you right here, I can put you down and put you in pain. Right? Does that yes. hurt? Okay, now what I want you to do... What I want you to do, and this is another one you got to watch playing with. I want you to envision a, wo a water wheel spinning right there. A water wheel spinning. <clears throat> he has to have his mind now at the point too. Now picture a water wheel spinning and lift your foot. <clears throat> That's truly the unbendable arm. That's about as unbendable as you're going to make it because now he has mind and the bladder meridian off the floor. Understand what I'm saying? He's got it all. So you have to put your mind to the spot. Somebody just told me, well, he kicked me here, and I had my hands crossed, and I still felt it. 
Well, but was your mind at your hands crossing, or did your mind go down here? No, but you need the spinning wheel. You've got to envision, envision your meridians. It seems a little weird, but with water flowing through. Nothing's going to stop it. However, you have to realize your weak points, because even though he does the spinning wheel, what he does, in essence, is stops his own energy and makes it weaker right there. In other words, he makes the next point weaker up, but you have to know that. Got that? In other words, I'll get you, try to put you down, if you do the spinning wheel. That's the next thing I look out for. Because people can do, on any point in the body, we've experimented with it on knockouts, everything, you can stand and picture your neck spinning, and we'll hit you with a technique that would normally knock you out, and it won't knock you out. But you keep in mind, if I hit him with a technique that would normally knock him out, and he's used playing the mind game with the spinning wheel, that if I drop onto one of the hard points or one of the lower points, it's going to be worse than on that arm. Because when you do a spinning wheel, when I do the spinning wheel here, you are backing up, picture water running, picture water running, and picture me stopping it, it backs up. And I only pushed him on the next point up. If I hit him on the next point up, it'll just drop him because he's backed his own energy into that point and made that point twice as weak as it normally would be. So I want you to understand the whole theory that if you, a lot of you in this room might teach other people. <coughs> you understand that? I know Mark Klein goes and, and does some of his own seminars. And, and some of you guys might want to do that. Or even a small seminar. You might know somebody that says, come on to my school and just show this to a few of the people. Well, you got to know, you just got to know this. I don't want this taught out of this room, though. I don't want everybody running around spinning the wheel and lifting the foot and going, you can't hurt me, you can't hurt me. Because I'll still hurt them. You're not going to hurt by accident. You know what I mean? They think they're doing something great, and all of a sudden you lay one on them, and you, you, you'll break an arm, you'll injure something. Same with this. If you, if you walked into uh, a Wally J. Remy Priest seminar and started spinning that wheel, they're not going to break your wrist by accident. They wouldn't intend to. That was you that did it. So you have to watch how you play with this. You have to know what... I'm talking about real self-defense. You use this stuff within a split second. You use the cross, and if they're going to kick you in the legs, all you do is picture the plant, the tree going... Picture a tree planted in the ground. Picture the energy dropping. And they'll kick you in the leg and you won't feel it. Then a lot of times you have to experiment with this when I'm not around. I don't go in my karate class and do that. Because we only can do it once. I work on this at seminars. I just had like eight straight seminars. This is, this is uh, what, the third one of these camps this year so far. And I've had eight straight seminars. I just come back with the whole tour from Atlanta, Georgia, North Carolina, up into Indiana. And what I do is I go up and I'm working on you, I'm working on you, I'm working on you. I'm working on hundreds of different people so that I don't injure them. So I can't come in every class. And I got him up, he didn't feel it. But I got him up and did a cold turkey, he didn't feel it. That's the way it'll be out in the street. After the third time, you all know about three times on a pressure point making it weaker. So after three times on a pressure point, he's going to start to feel it. But it still won't be the same pain as the last seminar if I grabbed you and put you down. The minute you go like this, you'll feel the pain. It won't be the same. And now put your mind into it. It won't be the same. Very gently get up, put the guy down, and then do spinning wheel. Just like I did. Get him up. Watch. Turn his hand this way. So that that point is really vulnerable. Push it towards center line. So that he feels pain. And then, and make him feel the pain, which I already did to him. Then tell him, get the spinning wheel going. And you'll find out it's very difficult. <coughs> now do the spinning wheel and lift the foot. I want it in order. I don't want you to just jump to the third. I want you to spin the wheel now and lift the foot. But you know, if I kick him in that other leg right now, I'm probably going to break that wrist. Then I want you to do the spinning wheel. And picture this. See if he doesn't get down. Notice I change figures? Everybody try that. <laughs> I got into this several years ago, and I actually discovered it in the Hanchi. I think... Uh, 
I don't know if it was last year or the year before, that we did an advanced Nahanji seminar here. Was it last year or the year before? Last year. Was it last year? Well, that should have been a mind blower, right? Mm -hmm. Well, now you should fit this in with that. This will fit right in with that. So, I mean, you know what we did last year and where to attack? I can do that, put this together with it, and I'm avoid for a second. The only thing is, the only thing is, here, stand up here. He can know it. He can null and void. He can null and void. But you can't null and void fast enough if your hands are quick enough to strike. He doesn't know where I'm going to strike. He goes to cover. He goes to cover. He don't, he, don't know, he don't know which one of these is going to connect with that point. So he can't move the spinning wheel that fast. I've experimented with that. In other words, he can, do the, he can stop the, he can even get the spinning wheel going here. Don't feel the same. But if I hit you here... <laughs> in other words, you can't spin the wheel everywhere. That didn't feel the same, right? No, but this one... No. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So you can get the wheel going, and you can stand there and actually take a shot. Take a shot. We went... Uh, sit down. Thank you. <laughs> We were over in, there's a little, little uh, humor here, but we were in Scotland, and some of the people in Scotland think that they can take a shot. In fact, there's a local pub, and, and the one guy, they will bet, they will bet money, they will bet money that you can hit them, and the guy will take your shot. They got a guy built about like you, built about like you that just is a fighter. And he'll let you hit him. Stand there like this, let you hit him. And he's doing this. I don't know who taught it to him, but you get people doing these little things here, little things there. They don't have the full system put together. But he'll not avoid it. And I told the guys in Scotland, we were over in Scotland, I said, he won't take my shot. And the one guy in my seminar says, well, I take a good shot myself. I didn't go to that pub. Because I'd have been in a fight you wouldn't believe. <laughs> <laughs> that whole bar would have been chasing me down the street. Because they'd have laid some big money on this guy taking my shot. You understand? They'd have laid some big money, my age, my size. And I mean, this guy's like this. And they bet. And I would have covered all wages and I would have dropped him. But to get out of there without money, because <laughs> I'd have dropped him. But anyways, the guy that was in the seminar, I dropped him. Same thing. He started spinning the wheel, and I said, I'm going to hit you now with this, I'm going to hit you now with this. And he started that, and I'm going to hit him on the other side. <laughs> <laughs> I learned that when I was watching Ralph Crandon and Norton. <laughs> Norton, Norton was teaching Crandon to fight, and he said, block your face, block your face, and then he punched him in the belly. Remember that? Well, you should learn from those shows. <laughs> 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 That's part of this is what's happening. Now, you ask about energy against your opponent. <coughs> energy against your opponent. This is one thing that I worked with Muhammad Ali on. If you don't know, I trained with Muhammad Ali for three and a half years. And I didn't know this then. I didn't know the pressure points then. Or even with his bad arms, he could still be champion. Because he was good enough that he'd only have to touch a few points and the fight would be over. I mean, Ali was good and fast in his day, like you wouldn't believe. But I did work with him on focusing through. I was in energy flow and focusing through your opponent. And he was very successful with that. He made jabs feel like they were full-on punches. And you focused the energy. I explained to him, and he felt it. And he felt it. Was it you that felt it? And I'm yeah. not. <laughs> we did. You all saw the uh, the uh, rib cage in my first book with the fist. Okay. Second book. Man has the illustrations gonna blow people's minds. We got the rib cage. We have the heart. Medically, an exact place behind it where it's located. And then we have the points on the chest to connect with the heart. I mean, it's going to blow people's minds. You look at anyone's nipple line, so you can, you can pick it out immediately. Look at anyone's nipple line, and you know where the jugular notch is. It's the, the hole right here. And by the way, if you don't know, if you haven't played with it, you have to be careful with that. But the jugular notch is not a pressure point. You, you, 
you're getting the wind, but in a 45 degree angle down, there is a pressure point. It's internal. And, and a lot of moves will do this and show you that angle and direction. I don't know this for a matter of fact. It's like hard point one. But it said if you really <coughs> spear down and in and touch that point, that he will die. He will stop breathing. You can just do this and he feels it. You can do this and he feels it. But right down and in on a 45 degree angle, there is a pressure point. I'm only telling in case you play with the regular <coughs> knot. I do too, but I stay up, I stay up in this surface. I don't really spear down and in hard. In a real fight situation, I'm going to dig and go down in like I mean it, but there's a chance of stopping the person from breathing right then and there. It just shuts off all the breathing apparatus. The point is internal. It's at a 45 degree angle down from where I see right here, and I would push as if I'm going down to the floor on that angle, and I would let the water flow out of my hand, and I would hook in and down, and that's what it's said to do, so I've just never done that to people. I get enough of a reaction with just this. You can just do this to people. And you get enough of a reaction. And that's not the one point I'm going to show you. The one point that we describe in the book. This is the breast. This is the jugular notch. Midway between, there's a pressure point right here. When you see my book, you'll see that it lays exactly over the control nerve that has the heart uh, functioning. Uh, halfway between, halfway between. You don't have to see it. If you listen, this is the breast. This is the jugular notch. Go halfway. Go halfway. That point needs this. <coughs> needs this. Most people do this, and he feels it. But that point needs this, because the nerve goes that <coughs> way. We show it in my book, book two. The nerve goes right over, and it controls the blood gate out of the heart, which the blood gate controls your blood pressure, everything. You can make that blood gate stop open for a split second with just a decent hit, which I don't do this hard or often to people because it will make them cough. If you do it real hard and you don't do it with the water flow I just showed you, that's where you have to learn control and what you do to somebody. I can just tap, and I'm going to do it without the water control. I'll look this way. I can tap this way, and, and he'll feel it all the way into that heart. And that's with the mild tap. You feel that? <coughs> yes. It'll, it'll light your head up. It'll make your head feel like it's going to blow off your shoulders. And this is the, that is the place where Wally J hit a guy with this. If you've never heard the story, and the guy went down and was coughing, Wally thought he was going to die, and, and the guy spit up blood and the whole bit. I had one case out in Indiana where I hit a guy, and he went down and spit up blood. Just as quick as not, because I hit a guy right there. But you have to not only get that, but you must know that the direction is that way. In the book, we don't tell that, because we can't have somebody walk out. In other words, I have the points in my book, and when you're in a seminar, I can tell you what to do to somebody. But I can't put that in the book. You understand, some kid can do that to another kid and kill him. This is the spot. You punch it, you look at the point in my book, you torque it this way. And actually, if you want to know something, I, I think you're getting a hint by now, but every time they taught you to do full twist punches and go this way, you understand everything they taught uh, because of the war was the opposite. Most of them are this way. You understand? We should all be doing our katas and going like this, <coughs> not like this. You understand? But then that's good for advanced, advanced people to know. You were at the other seminar where I hit a guy up in here, and you saw that the twist was this way. You know that if you hit here, that the twist is this way. And now I'm telling you, if you hit here, the twist is this way. So it's, it's the, the opposite of what most karate schools practice, to hurt somebody. They had them practicing the kids, the safe method, the kids' method. Way back, I think, of the four or five seminars here at, at Jim Clive School, I taught you this is where to palm to push somebody off somebody. This is where to strike. I probably didn't make it as clear that that's the pressure point that I would truly want. I just had you doing this. If, if a person is going to uh, uh, punch you and you push him on this side, you'll make him hit you harder with that side. We explain this in my book. If you push him on this side, you're going to make him hit you harder with that side. If you know how to drop your energy on that point, he actually can't hit you with either hand or kick you. This is the place you would hit if someone is going to give you a sucker punch. You're at close range and the guy's going to sucker punch. If you had one place to go for, you drop into that point with this, with that knuckle, and he is going to go back and neither hand will function and neither leg can kick you.
I, I actually, at some of my seminars, I'm telling people, go ahead and try to punch me or kick me. Go ahead. And you'll see that just that nullifies everything. And if I truly hit with it, or if I truly do this with it, with the energy and the water flow that you just were hitting with, you can injure somebody. You can stop the heart momentarily. What happens is the blood gate is going like this. The blood gate will pause open for a split second, and blood will flow back into the heart. That's exactly what happens medically. The blood gate's going like this. That pressure point makes it stop. Blood flows back in. As it flows back in, it pulls the gate shut, and it starts going again, hopefully. But there's a chance it wouldn't, so they didn't. you can revive right there at the same point. If you know my revival, you have to sit up. You can't lay down. You have to go back and do revival at the same spot to start that blood gate. So if for some reason he went down and wasn't breathing, which is what happened to Wally J. He hit the guy, and the guy went down, and Wally ran over, and he wasn't even sure what he did, it, and he just smacked the guy. And it started everything, the guy was okay. But the guy was there and could not breathe momentarily. You can get up, and one side can, you can reach out to grab, or you can pretend you're gonna punch. And I want you to just, I don't want you twisting, I want an open palm, and I, I want you just to be dead center there. But then I want you to know the point that you're after. That'll work on everybody. If he's heavier and his chest comes out like this, you just have to get in and down on it. But I don't want you to do too much because I don't want anybody hurt. And there's a heart control point. Try that uh, on each other. <laughs> on that, angle and direction, down and in. If I'm doing it, how many Tai Chi moves you see do that? You don't have to go study Tai Chi. You will see them drop. You will see the hand drop and this hand doing something. It's even going to work better if you can be pulling his arm, either of his arms, and you pull and drop. Uh, Jim Clapp at his house has a Tai Chi figure. We were looking at it last night, and the guy is <laughs> like this. He's stopping your attack, I would think, with what we covered earlier. He's got an arm stretch, and he's dropping on the chest. So when you see these figures, they tell a lot. They tell me more now than they would have 10 years ago. Because you just look at him and go, wonder what he's doing. Right? I'm sure you do now, too, right? whole world's a little better because of this stuff. Because like I said, I read a soccer book, and there was a guy pierced with a floating rib, and he died. He actually died. That's in the book. Go, go look at it. You don't need to buy the book for that. The man died in 1990 in the World Cup when the floating rib was hit with an elbow. Well, I know the angle and direction. That way. And he died, and they couldn't understand it, it says. They don't know how he died from that play. Well, all they'd have to do is talk to me, and I'll tell you how he died from that play. They couldn't understand how he bled internally and bled to death in his kidney. That's what it says in the book, because they fully say that. That no one knows how that guy died. You know, it was through things like this. Well, I'm going to work you on something else we worked on, and that's how to kick a leg out. We did that out in Chicago. We're going to go after the rear leg. And I'm going to have you stand up and get in a front stance. I'm going to have you drop from here to a front stance. Here to a front stance. Then I want you to drop to a front stance. How many people have a cutter where you do a little shuffle front? Okay, I want you to shuffle back. You pay attention to somewhere in one of your katas that you will do that. I have a kata that starts out, gankaku, like this, and then does a frontal attack. This move, you lock the leg. You have a cut or you lock the leg. Okay? But you stand. A guy can be behind you. I'm going to grab you or anything. you got to cross his leg like this. <laughs> See what I did? cross it. I make an X. Only I gotta go beyond and do the shuffle.
I use that, or would use that, in fact, you almost see me use it on the cross routine, or if a guy lifts his foot up, I'll just turn and do that. If I have you, if I have you by this, and you lift that foot, or if I have you by this, and you lift that foot, I'm probably just going to do that real quick. I might injure something, but I'm going to go right after it real fast. And I'm probably just going to do that. All I need to do is here, you back into somebody. The guy can be, stand up. The guy's just behind you. You just back into him. You just back into him. It's done the same as that. Stand up. <laughs> and at the same time, imagine that I had a finger. I don't want you to have a finger. At the same time, I would have your finger, I would have you in a lock, and I have a cut at the starts right here, right here. And an opponent's behind you. <coughs> He goes to grab you, you grab his finger or his hand, and you pull to here. You bend his finger, go to here, and do that. And he'll go down with a broken finger. I don't want you to do that. I just want you to work on the leg portion. <clears throat> Stand up. This way. Set foot. Stand up. <laughs> <laughs> See how I do it? Same as this, only this. You must have the body in motion to use your rear leg for a sweep. The more my body is in motion, the easier the technique. In other words, stand up. I do not go to here and then. A front leg takedown, you can get away with that. But when a person is backing up, your body, meaning my body, must be in motion. I must be moving for the attack. <coughs> I just back into the guy and finish it. Originally, the way it was taught to me by the man that was on the cover of the magazine that I told you about was that was to break a neck. You were to grab him like this. The rest happens. In other words, you really should be doing this as you kick his head, leg out from under. And I learned that way before pressure points. I just put the two together with that. And you were in Chicago. I think we were teaching that. Weren't we teaching that there? Yes, sir. Yeah. And I just backed in anybody. In fact, as you're doing it, I'll back around the room. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, that's right. That's right. Uh, our school out in Indiana, uh, Larry Bird studies with, the, with the, the two guys that we do seminars for, Will Higginbotham and Larry Bird. Uh, and they taught him this, they taught him a couple of things, and he used them in scrimmages, but he wouldn't use them in the games. He's afraid to use them in the games. But uh, honestly, the scrimmage, he leveled the guy with that technique. By accident, he meant like he was going to get the ball, and he just went kaboom, and the guy went down. <laughs> And he had the ball. And uh, the next seminar we do out in Indiana, he's supposed to be there. Larry Bird's supposed to attend it because he is studying there. He is uh, studying with that school. I want you to try that. I want you to get the guy to stand behind you. His, his feet can be this way. His feet can be this way. It don't matter how his feet are. If they're this way, you just have to be, you have to watch because you, you could break his knees or you're still going to level him. In other words, you can have your feet together. And I'm just going to take both your feet. I don't care. But that's where the injury could happen. So I don't want that. Stand in a normal stance that a person grabbing you from behind would be in. And you just go like this. Only thing you have to pay attention to is that your leg crosses theirs. 45 degree angle. Like Nahanji. Everybody get up and do that. And featured in Ripley's Believe It or Not five times, once for breaking a thousand pounds of ice with his elbow.
With a samurai sword, he has cut an apple off my wife's head. I've cut uh, cucumbers and watermelons off people's bodies. Blindfolded, George has won over 300 trophies, appeared on 35 national TV shows, and on the covers of several karate magazines. Dillman Karate videos, and there are 15, have been sold in 17 countries. And now... At 50, George says he's in the best shape of his career, which started 41 years ago at age 9 in Pottsville. And you know, I believe him. Touch your nose to the floor. Ouch. In his teens, George was a professional boxer, and after karate training in the service, came home to teach it, opening his first school in 1968. Since then, over 60 Dillman Karate International affiliates have opened around the world, including Australia and New Zealand, where he gives seminars. George's new headquarters in Reading is the first studio of its kind specifically built for karate. Here he teaches fellow instructors and students for Kyukempo and the art of Tuite. Over the years, George has worked with some interesting people like Muhammad Ali, whom he trained at the Champs Deer Lake Camp. We did road work together. I worked with him on speed with his hands, and uh, we were good friends. Of Bruce Lee, his old training partner, George says he was probably faster and better than people can even imagine in the movies. Film stars Jean-Claude Van Damme and Chuck Norris know well this ninth-degree black belt from Reading, Pennsylvania. You've got to know that the pressure point is... Recently, George taught Chuck his now famous pressure point system, which may show up in the likable star's next movie. And if you catch the pressure point... He says he learned about pressure points from Hohan Sokan, an Okinawan tenth-degree black belt master. George says after World War II, the Japanese... ...taught the servicemen the moves, the actual, some of the moves, but they never taught them the secret meaning behind the moves. Oh, yeah! Well, I began to say... It's impressive, Joyce, but really, does it work? Listen. Um, under pressure in Reading, Wendell Woodbury, News 8. It does. I have seen him do that. He's something else. Well. Stretch in here, you hold on the stomach and then you tap. Oh, 